My name is Joe Bondi Denemy. Uh, I'm an assistant professor here in San Francisco at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, I'm in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, so hopefully I'm among fellow microbiologists here today. Um, uh, hopefully you're enjoying the meeting so far. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work in the world of bacteriophages and CRISPR. Perhaps you've heard of CRISPR-Cas at some point in, in your life, whether it's as a microbiologist or in the news. Um, so of course CRISPR is being discussed quite a bit as a, as a gene editing innovation that's transforming potential medical applications, but uh, I think we're all here to learn more about microbes. So I'm going to tell you only about microbes, because that's what we study in my lab, and I'm going to uh, hopefully get you to think about CRISPR a little bit from the perspective of a bacteriophage. So. Um, these are not slides that I often use, but they were, they were generously uh, made in consultation with ASM to communicate a little bit more about how CRISPR works. Um, and, and one analogy I often like to use for describing CRISPR to people is, is thinking of it as a shark, and that's going to become useful in a moment. Of course, CRISPR it stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Um, it's, a, it's a great acronym uh, for what it actually is. It's here in the bacterial genome. Um, and it's basically an array of repeats and, and that are direct repeats, uh, the same sequence over and over again, and it's the spacers between them, so just the space between them that is really where all the exciting information is. And this was only really recently discovered, maybe not 12 years ago, and it's amazing that these are hiding in so many bacterial and archaeal genomes, and it took us a long time to find them. And so these spacing sequences are what holds the information of about what this cell or this lineage of cells has seen in its past. And I think before CRISPR became RNA-guided nucleases, CRISPR was this in a bacterial genome where you could look at that bacterial genome and know the history of the transgressors it had seen, the phages and plasmids that had tried to take it over, and how the CRISPR array records this information. And that's why it's often referred to as an adaptive immune system, because these spacer sequences have a perfect or near-perfect identity or homology to these bacteriophages. And so, you know, before we really knew much about the system, it was actually known before it was even called CRISPR. In some microbes, this, these sequences were used for epidemiological purposes because they were different. In otherwise clonal isolates, these spacing sequences could tell you that strain A and strain B were not identical and you could track their, their lineages. Of course, now we know it's a bacterial immune system. And together with Cas proteins or CRISPR-associated proteins that are found usually right next to the CRISPR array, um, as all microbiologists know and love, if you want to find genes that work together, you get to just look to the left or look to the right. It makes, makes our lives very easy, and that's true for CRISPR-Cas. And one really famous protein, or a shark in this case, is called Cas9, the ninth Cas protein that was described. There are many other systems. There are six types of CRISPR system. I'm just going to focus on Cas9 for simplicity here. And uh, Cas9 is a single protein, and that's one of the reasons it's become really uh, useful and really interesting to a lot of people. And basically, when, when a phage infects a bacterial cell, this is meant to depict a naive situation. And what that means is, is there's a guide RNA, there's Cas9, but CRISPR is specific. This unmatched guide RNA that was derived from the CRISPR array has no base pairing potential with the phage genome. And that's why CRISPR, although it's uh, a really elegant immune system, it doesn't work at first glance. So unlike the more primitive or innate restriction enzymes, which we all know and love as, you know, in our freezer, those are innate in that they will respond to little uh, motifs, usually palindromic motifs, not based on whether they've seen them before, but just based on the specificity of those enzymes. So these systems work if they've seen the phage before, and in this depiction, this is a naive cell that has not seen this phage before, and what that means is that CRISPR is basically useless for this cell. This Cas9 shark or protein can't recognize the phage. The phage will do what it wants to do, whether that's enter the lytic cycle, replicate and kill the cell, or lysogenize by integrating into the bacterial genome. Uh, of course, famously with, with how phage lambda uh, does this, many other phages integrate into the genome. So that's an unmatched guide RNA, and from a mechanistic perspective, this is still in the shark's mouth, it's just not matching the phage, but let me move on to the next step. So, why is it adaptive or an acquired immune system? It's because CRISPR can react to this situation. So most infections will kill the cell, but CRISPR will prevail in some instances, and it's thought that when it does prevail, it's when the phage makes a mistake. It either can't replicate because it has a mutation, or it stalls, or it's a defective phage. Think of this analogously to a vaccine. 
where we have an, you know, an intentional dose of inactivated virus that's injected into us to enable an immune response without actually making us sick. In nature, the way CRISPR is thought to work is that a million infections, CRISPR uh, is unable to protect the cell, but one phage out of that million messes up somewhere, and that DNA is now a sitting duck. And what the CRISPR acquisition machinery does is takes a very small fragment of that phage DNA, and that becomes a new spacer, a new repeat gets added, and now this cell is no longer naive to this phage or to its cousins that have the same short sequence. We're talking only 30 base pairs. Now the system is primed, if you will. Now it's ready to mount an immune response when it sees this phage again. So let's look at that, uh, what that means. Okay, so now this Cas9 system or shark is ready. Think of this as, as in the next infection. So this cell survived, not because of CRISPR immunity. This cell survived because the phage stalled and didn't do its job properly, whatever that, whatever that might mean mechanistically. So that's why the cell survived, but then it was able to adapt with a new spacer. Now this cell is primed and able to mount a response to this phage infection in the future, and that's why these guys are freaking out a little bit. They know they're gonna get destroyed by the CRISPR shark. And so basically the way the system works now is with a matched or complementary guide RNA, uh, Cas9 will cut the phage DNA, and Cas9's simplicity is quite lovely. It melts the DNA base pairs between the guide and the protospacer or target sequence and causes a double-stranded break. And this is exactly how it's being used in the gene editing world. But in human cells, we fix those breaks and there are mutations, and that's the idea behind the therapy. In the phage world, uh, to my knowledge, there's no great examples of phages being able to repair these breaks. This is pretty much a dead end for a phage. Once it's cut, it's, it's, uh, its life is over, unless it's lucky enough to sort of recombine with, it, with another phage, which might not be too common. Okay, so does, this basically is how CRISPR works. It's how it goes from being naive to primed, and now it, with the base pairing interaction, and it's very specific. So it's not going to accidentally cut its own DNA. It's only going to cut the phage when it sees it. And that's one of the beautiful properties of this immune system, is once it's primed, it's really strong. So it's even stronger than restriction enzymes are. So I sort of think of restriction enzymes as the innate component that's really good at detecting these motifs and, and mounting a modest immune response. CRISPR is either totally useless in a naive state or totally amazing in a primed state. And once it's amazing, uh, it's really hard to stop. Okay, so phages are basically uh, in trouble. So that takes me to the next stage of the reaction here. Uh, in my lab at UCSF, we work quite heavily on understanding how phages respond to CRISPR-Cas immunity, okay? So as I just told you, this phage is in big trouble with the guide here, and it seems almost impossible for the phage to get around CRISPR unless it acquires a point mutation in the recognition sequence, and that certainly happens. Those are called escapers. And as you might imagine, mutations can work, but if a phage has to have a lot of mutations to avoid CRISPR, that's probably not gonna go on very long. So what we've discovered is that phages actually make small proteins that we call anti-CRISPRs. And these proteins are usually, uh, they look like DNA. And what that means is that we call them DNA mimics. They're small and negatively charged. And some high resolution structures actually show us that these proteins fold into a structure that looks a lot like B-form DNA with a negative uh, like a phosphate backbone type of appearance. And of course, that's not quite what's shown here. But think of the anti-CRISPRs as basically a wedge in the mouth of, of the, the, the shark here, where it can no longer cut the DNA. And like I said, mechanistically, the reason we think this works is because the phage is basically spitting out a DNA-like molecule and saying, hey, hey, shark, hey, CRISPR, over here, come grab onto this. And in the meantime, the actual DNA is left uncut and the phage can go on doing what it wants to do, replicating or, or entering lysogeny. Now what's amazing about these proteins is that their diversity is really astounding. So every time we look at a new phage in a region that we've identified as we call an anti-CRISPR locus, where the phage stores its anti-CRISPR genes, we see a different gene. And so related phages that are essentially 95% identical across their whole genome have pockets of diversity, and one of those pockets is the anti-CRISPR locus. So phage A will have one gene there, and page B will have a totally different gene there, a non-homologous gene that's come from a different evolutionary trajectory, and both of them are individually sufficient to inhibit Cas9. So phages are innovating, acquiring genes from various locations, whether they're DNA mimic type proteins or other mechanisms, and using them to stop CRISPR. Now the last layer on this challenge is that we came to realize in my lab that this is a really hard thing to do. 
If this cell is primed and the shark is ready to cut the DNA, we and others have actually seen that the DNA gets cut within a minute or two of when the phage DNA injects. And now, as you might imagine, the anti-CRISPR proteins are the very first thing the phage transcribes, but it's facing an uphill battle. And that's why the shark analogy, I think, is so apt, that it's DNA coming in to uh, you know, blood-stained, shark-infested waters, and the, the system is primed and ready to cut the phage DNA. And so what we discovered is that it's actually not quite like this, where a phage comes in, makes an anti-CRISPR, and protects itself. We've actually observed that the first phage that comes in here dies. The, the DNA gets cut by the shark, by Cas9, before it has time to make anti-CRISPR to protect itself. But what it does do is transcribe a little bit of anti-CRISPR mRNA. And that's what it leaves behind because that mRNA gets translated into anti-CRISPR protein. And even if I'm the first one going in, I die, I've left behind anti-CRISPR protein for my kin. And so what we've shown in the lab is that phages actually cooperate or operate through an altruistic-like mechanism whereby phage one might die, but it leaves behind protein that causes an immunocompromised state. And so we steal some language from, from eukaryotic immunology and HIV, for example, where cells become immunosuppressed. That's how we think of uh, CRISPR and anti-CRISPR, that eventually uh, phages in a community will be able to overcome CRISPR-Cas immunity. And the proof for this is that we see very clear multiplicity of infection tipping points, where if there's too little phage in a population, it's like they don't have anti-CRISPRs at all. But as soon as we reach a certain point, the phages can replicate because they're working together to infect a cell. And so we think of the CRISPR anti-CRISPR arms race as an altruistic and cooperative process where phages work together. And more recently in my lab, we've discovered a number of new mechanisms that phages use to inhibit or get around CRISPR that are actually less cooperative and more autonomous. So now we're looking for mechanisms where phages can go at it alone and at a very low MOI when they're basically alone in a population can actually neutralize CRISPR. And those are totally distinct and novel mechanisms that we're characterizing. Uh, so I just want to leave you with, I think they t there's a, a GIF here. Let me see if this works. Does it move? There we go. Okay. So from a naive state to a prime state of immunity, that's CRISPR 101. The next layer on it is that anti-CRISPR proteins are out there. And then the next layer on that is it's a little more complicated than you might think, that phages need to really cooperate to deploy these proteins successfully. So I hope, I hope that uh, helps uh, inform a little bit of the world of CRISPR and phage. And uh, thanks so much for coming, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks.